Oh, we give you praise, oh God. Our eyes are on you. Woo! Come on, put your hands together. Clap it out. We know you never let us down, God. You've never failed and you never will. Woo! Enemies surround me. Mountains before me. I won't be afraid. You go before me. Enemies surround me. Woo! Mountains before me. I won't be afraid, you go before me, you won't let me down, no, you won't let me down, no, you won't let me down, no, come on, catch this, you won't let me down, no, you won't let me down, no, come on, lift it up, you won't let me down, no, you won't let me down, no. trust is in you we believe in you oh god oh god and you will never let us down so we declare it we decree it we shout it out hallelujah Amen. Well, praise God for the praise team. Amen. Well, welcome to Harvest Rain Church International. If this is your first time viewing with us on behalf of Pastor Doug, Pastor Ingrid, and the entire Harvest Rain Church family, we say welcome and we invite you out to worship, worship with us again. Amen. We're here every Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m. We're here for Wednesday evening Bible study at 7.30 p.m. And we're also here at the church outside in the parking lot every Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m. Now the weather is just about perfect right now and we're having a glorious time in the Lord, amen? People are getting saved, people are joining the church. Only thing that's missing is you, amen? So we invite you out, that's every Sunday morning, 
8.30 a.m. Again, we're in our cars. We're socially distanced, so it's safe, and it's a glorious time in the Lord. Amen? Well, at this time, Pastor Doug is up next. So grab your Bibles, your Bible apps, and sit back and relax. Well, God bless you this morning. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we bless you and we honor you this morning. Father, we are so appreciative, Lord, of being able to gather around your word. And Father, as always, we welcome the ministering gift of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence. We invite you in. It is our prayer this morning that you would minister to every heart listening to this teaching this morning. We pray that as the word of the Lord is released into the atmosphere, that it will change lives. We pray that no one will be allowed to hear this teaching this morning and not change. And so we thank you for your supernatural intervention this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you this morning. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, this morning, I just want to take a few uh, minutes of your time to encourage you not to quit. Not to quit. Don't give up on the word. Don't give up on your faith. Don't walk away from your faith. Don't give up on your faith. Some of us are so close to what we're believing God for that it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing how close you are if you don't quit, if you don't faint, if you don't walk away from the word. Now, let me explain what I'm saying, because I recognize that a lot of you will say, well, I would never walk away from my faith. I would never walk away from God. You may not physically walk away. From the church you may not physically walk away from reading your word but in your spirit you can distance yourself from the word of God by your belief and I'm urging you this morning don't allow your situation your circumstances or the lack of things playing out the way you want them to play out uh, cause you to, to quit. Um, fight against the urge to quit on your faith and on God. In other words, don't just go through the, the, um, the, the motions of being a Christian. You know, you go to church, you read your Bible, you, you pay your tithes, you do whatever you're supposed to do in the church. But your, your faith has dried up. Your faith has basically just withered. But you're going through the, the motions of being a Christian. You don't want to live your life like that. You don't want to be a Christian that's just um, going through the process for the sake of, I don't want to go to hell, so I'm just going to go through this thing until, you know, this thing is over. No, you want to be a believer, man, that's full of faith and full of power and full of God, God's anointing, man. You, you want to be one of those who are constantly expecting God to do great things when you wake up in the morning. The Bible says over in Lamentations that our mercies are brand new every morning. In other words, every morning, God is endowing us with his mercies and his mercy for us to achieve something greater for that day. And so you've got to wake up with great expectation, man. Don't quit on your faith. The Bible says in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, the text says, In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, the text says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Bible lets us know that God and his word are the same. Jesus and his word are the same, or Jesus and the word are the same. 
So if you give up on the word, you're really giving up on Jesus. And so I'm encouraging you this morning not to give up on this word. Don't give up on the word of God. See, the word of God is the only thing that God has given us as Christians to fight against spiritual uh, attacks of the enemy and to deal with spiritual things. And so if you give up on the word, you can't deal with spiritual things. It is the word of God that changes our life. And so if you give up on the word, then you've given up on the very thing that's designed to change your life. And that's what the enemy wants, man. He wants you to get so fed up and get so frustrated with the word and get so frustrated, frustrated with things not playing out the way you want them to play out or for you to lose patience in waiting on God that you just kind of just throw your hands up and say, well, you know, this church stuff ain't working. This word's not working. This faith stuff don't work. My prayers are not being answered. I just, you know, it's, it's working for them, but it's not working for me. No, 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 no. Don't buy into that. Do not quit on the word of God. Over in Acts chapter 20, the apostle Paul, he was saying farewell to the elders of Ephesus. And he says in verse 22, and I'm reading out of the NIV translation. Again, this is the apostle Paul. He's talking to the elders at Ephesus. He's giving his farewell speech. He says in verse 22, and now compelled by the spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. He, he lets the elders know, listen, I'm giving you my farewell speech. I'm saying goodbye to you because I'm compelled by the spirit, by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Verse 23, Paul says, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Verse 24, he says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. So Paul is saying his farewell to the elders and he says, I'm compelled by the Holy Spirit to get to Jerusalem. He says, but the Holy Spirit keeps warning me that prison and hardship is facing me or is, is, is waiting on me when I get to Jerusalem. He says, but I consider my life as nothing if I can't finish and complete the task that Jesus has given me to complete. And he says that task is testifying of the gospel of God's grace. Now notice what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that my life is nothing. If I am not able to fulfill my assignment for the Lord. So Paul says, even though I'm leaving you, I probably will never see you again. I'm not going to give up and quit on the word. I'm not going to give up and quit on my assignment. Now watch what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. The apostle Paul, he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so now over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he's encouraging uh, the saints to be steadfast. He says, be ye steadfast. Now, what he means by that is stand your guard, be firm, be strong, be fixed in your faith, don't be shaken, and don't allow yourself to have double talk or to think uh, uh, double-minded, if you will. That's what he means when he says, be steadfast. And then he says, be unmovable, meaning be firm, be fixed in your faith, be stable. And then he says this, always abounding in the work of the Lord meaning always be engaged in doing the will of God, in promoting his glory, and in advancing his kingdom. And then he says, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Paul is telling the church, he says, be steadfast, unmovable, knowing that your labor 
will not be in vain. In other words, whatever you're doing for the kingdom of God, whatever you're doing for the sake of the gospel, he says, it will not be in vain. God will not be indebted to any man. Whatever you and I do on behalf of the kingdom of God, God's going to see to it that we are rewarded for our labor in reference to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why you should not allow yourself to think that what you're doing is not important for the kingdom, to think that, okay, I'm doing this, but no one's noticing or nothing's happening. You don't need anyone to notice but one person. You have an audience of one, and that audience is God. And here's the other thing you need to understand. Notwithstanding what you may be doing for the kingdom of God, you and I are not responsible for results. I'm not responsible for growing the church. I'm not responsible for healing people's bodies. I'm not responsible for changing people's lives. I can't do that. You can't do that. We are just human beings. We are only responsible for being vessels and allowing God to use us as he sees fit in any situation, any circumstance. All we have to do is be willing vessels to speak or to go wherever God says go or to speak wherever God says speak. God is responsible for the results. So many believers are allowing themselves to, to quit and to give up on their faith because in their mind they're thinking or the enemy has told them that what they're doing for the kingdom of God is of no use. Lives are not being changed. Nothing's changing. It's the same old humdi humdi stuff. So same old, same old. You got to understand that's what the enemy wants you to think. You're not responsible for results. I'm not responsible for results. I can't save souls. You can't save souls. It is a job in the ministry of the Holy Spirit to heal bodies, to save people, to deliver people. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We can't do the work of the Holy Spirit. All we can do is be steadfast, unmovable, not be moved from our faith. Stay with the program, man. Stay with the program. Stay with this word. Paul is saying to us, in essence, stick it out. Some of us this morning need to hear that. Stick it out. Stay with the program. Fight against the urge of giving up. It's very important that you and I keep the faith. Faith says, I'm never going to let go. That's what faith says. Faith says, I'm never going to let go. No matter what I see, I'm not letting go. No matter what I hear, I'm not letting go. No matter what I think, I'm not letting go. No matter how I perceive something, I'm not letting go. Faith says, I'm not going to let go of the word of God. Refuse to quit on your faith. Paul says over in 2 Timothy, Chapter four, he says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time has come for my departure. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul says, my departure is at hand. Paul knew that he was getting ready to transition over. He knew that his life was coming to her end. He was locked up in a Roman prison, he knew that this time he wasn't going to get out. He knew that this time God was not going to deliver him. Now, he knew that God had delivered him in many situations, in many uh, circumstances. God came to his call. God delivered him from the hand of the Roman soldiers. He delivered him from the, the, the Jewish people who were trying to uh, uh, take his life. But he knew this time that he was not going to get out of that situation. He knew that this was it. He knew that this was uh, time. This was the time of his departure. And he said, I'm ready to be poured out like a drink offering. He said, I'm ready. I am ready to go, man. I am ready to transition. I am ready to give my life for the gospel. I'm ready to give my life for this word, man. He said, I'm ready. I'm ready to pour out my life like a drink offering. He says, the time of my departure has come. He says this, which are powerful words. He said, I have fought the good fight. I kept the faith. I finished the course. He said, I kept the faith. I want to encourage you this morning, man. Keep the faith. 
When things are not going well on the job, keep the faith. When your marriage is being challenged and you, you don't know how to fix it, don't know what to do to fix it, keep the faith. When you're sick, when you have a sickness in your body, when you have an infirmity that's, that's nagging your flesh, keep the faith. When you have children who are making bad decisions and seem as if they have no home training and they're gone left, Paul says, keep the faith. When the church folks get on your last nerve, when church, when you are just sick of church, when you have come to the conclusion, I just don't know if I can do church anymore, keep the faith. Learn how to keep the faith. Paul said, I have finished my course. We have to learn how to finish our course. We have to learn how to complete what God has started us to do. Or what he has started us out to do. We just, we got to learn how to follow through. Notwithstanding any situation, any circumstance, how you feel, what you see, what you hear, what you think, what your perspective is. We have to learn how to have follow through. To keep the faith. We have to learn how not to give up on God. Jesus had to pass the urge to quit. Over in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus had to pass the test. He wanted to quit, but he had to pass that test not to quit. Verse 36, the text says, Then come a Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and said unto the disciples, Sit he here, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Verse 38, then said he unto them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death, tarry here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it be possible that this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy wilt. So Jesus had to get past the craving of giving up or to get past wanting to quit because of the pressure that was on his physical body and against his, against his psychic. And he gives us the key. He says, in essence, he says, it's in the will. It's in the will. He says, nevertheless, he says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. If it be possible, let this pressure of, of this situation pass. In other words, Father, if it's possible, allow me to get out of this situation. Allow me to get out of this uncomfortable, painful situation. But he says, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to walk away from this assignment. And he said, the key to me being able to get through this, he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So the, the, the key for you and I to uh, resist the urge to give up on our faith, to give up on this word, to give up on our journey with Christ is in the will. It's in our will. We have to will to do what God's called us to do. We have to make that decision. And that decision is based in our own individual wills. Now, watch this. Most folks quit because they don't get their way. Or they quit because things get difficult. They quit because, you know, it's inconvenient. Or the moment they get corrected, they, they quit because they don't like chastisement or they quit because they get told no. Most adults are like children. They don't like to be told no. They just don't like to be told no. And if you ever want to know what a nature of a wolf is, poke the wolf and you'll find out what that nature of that wolf is. It's the same thing with, with, uh, with saints. Man, you ever want to know what their nature is, man, just tell them no. But you tell a saint no, man, and I tell you a lot of them, just, just, oh, they just can't stand no. Like kids. 
Kids can't stand it. They want something, give it to me, give it to me. You tell them no, they just have a fit. They throw a temper tantrum. A lot of saints are like that. They're okay until you tell them no. As soon as they, as soon as they hear no, I, I don't feel led. And the first thing that comes to their mind is, I don't have to do this. I don't have to put up with this. I don't have to be here. I don't have to tolerate this. What are they saying? I quit. I give up. Why? Because the way they want things to be are not going their way. And I'm telling you this morning that you and I have to um, fight the urge to want to walk away from our faith. I don't know about you, but I am so glad that Jesus Christ rebuked that mindset of giving up. He rebuked it in the garden. He could have gave up. And had Jesus given up in the garden, we would have lost humanity. But he saved all humanity because he refused to give up. He rebuked, he rebuked the urge of quitting. And I'm telling you this morning, you've got to be just like Jesus and rebuke that spirit of quitting when it tries to come on you. You know, we want to quit our marriages. We want to quit our jobs. We want to quit church. We want to quit uh, serving in the church. You know, we want to quit uh, the business. We just, we just want to quit when things get tough. Things are going to get tough. Life is tough. Jesus warns us. He says, in this world, you're going to have some trouble. You're going to have some tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. But just because things get tough, don't mean that you quit. Just because the marriage gets a little testy, don't mean you quit. Just because your finances get a little testy, don't mean you quit tithing because, you know, you, you don't miss a few bills or you don't screwed up your money. And now, you, you know, you figure, well, I just need to do something different. No, you need to stay with the program. Stay with the word. Don't need to give up on the word. The word works. And I'm so glad that Jesus rebuked that mindset of giving up. There's a great saying that I came across, and um, I wish I knew who the author was because I would give him credit, but I, I don't know who the author is. But the saying goes like this. You do not determine a man's greatness by his talent or his wealth or his education. You determine a man's greatness by what it takes to discourage him and to get him to quit. Man, that's a powerful statement right there, a powerful saying. What does it take to discourage you? Because whatever it takes to discourage you, that's what the enemy is going to use to come at you if he knows that he can discourage you to the point that you no longer pray like you're supposed to. If he knows that he can discourage you to the point where you no longer read your word like you're supposed to. If he knows that he can discourage you to the point where you no longer attend church, you no longer tithe, you no longer walk with Jesus, spend quiet time with the Lord, he will discourage you to that place where he knows that if that's what it takes to get you to quit, if that's what it takes to get you to just throw your hands up and say, you know what, this faith stuff's not working, that's what he's going to do to discourage you. My question to you this morning is, what does it take to discourage you? What does it take to get you to quit? What does it take to get you to quit? I told the Lord years ago, the Lord called me to preach. Now I got to be honest with you, I was not um, happy about it because I had seen behind the scenes ministry. I've always been behind the scenes in ministry. And what I mean by that is the Lord has always allowed me to see the workings of ministry behind the pulpit, in the office, in the meetings with the man and the woman of God and how people act and how the leadership act and how uh, members act. And I, 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 I always seen, if you will, how sausage was made in the church. And if you know anything about sausage being made in the natural, it's an ugly, ugly situation. 
It's the same thing in the church. If you ever see how organizations operate, some of them, not all of them, it can be ugly because people are people. People can be mean, people can be cruel, people can be impatient, people can be um, vindictive. And just like it is in the church, it is in the organization. People are just people. People just do what people do. And so when the Lord called me to ministry, I, I just was not very thrilled about it. I said, well, you know, <laughs> Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do. Just don't let me make me preach. I, I'll, I'll serve the set man. I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I, I, you know, I don't care what it is. And I have basically done everything in ministry from working in the children's ministry to youth ministry to you name it, parking cars, to everything but saying. They would never let me sing. <laughs> Praise God. But I, I was willing to do it, man. I was, you know, if that's, if that's what it takes, I'll, I'll sing too. But I'm just, they never asked me to do that because I'm not graced to do that. But I was not happy about it, but I did it. But I told the Lord, I said, now, telling me to do this thing I'm, I'm in it I'm in it until you take me home I'm not going I'm not going to quit no matter what it takes to get it done I'm going to get it done if I'm the only one moving I'm going to be the only one moving but I made up my mind that when I said yes to the Lord that that yes was a yes it was not a maybe it was not when things went well it was not when things are uh, going according to plan, it was yes. No matter what it looked like, no matter how I felt, no matter what anyone said, no matter if I was by myself, it was, it was yes. I said, yes, Lord. And I have determined in my heart at that time that my yes was going to be a yes until Jesus takes me home. And I determined in my heart I wasn't going back. I wasn't going back to the world. I know, I know saints who were in ministry who was serving on front line who have gone back into the world. Now I'm not criticizing them, I'm just simply giving you a fact. I, you know, that's what they have done. And I'm telling you this morning, you've got to make up in your mind that your yes is a yes to Jesus. And that you're not going back to the world, you're not going backwards in terms of your, your commitment level to God, that you're going to stick with your yes. And whatever you told the Lord you're going to do, you need to do that. And if you're weak in committing that commitment or uh, fulfilling that commitment, you need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to strengthen you to get you through the process. Don't just allow life to toss you around like a ship in the ocean. Because if you do, you're going to end up anywhere. You've got to learn how to anchor yourself down in this word and let this word anchor you and make up in your mind, man. To him I live, to him I die. Just think about all the people who gave up when things got hard. Just think about that. Think about the people you know who gave up in your lifetime doing certain things with you, who gave up and you know that had they just kept going, they would have been further down, down the road. Daniel could have gave up. Daniel in the lion's den. He could have gave up, but Daniel didn't give up. Joseph could have gave up. You know, his brother sold him into slavery. Potiphar's wife lied on him. Joseph could have gave up, but he didn't give up. The three Hebrew boys could have given up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they could have given up, but they didn't give up. Jesus could have given up in the Garden of Gethsemane. I thank God that Jesus Christ did not give up on us. I thank God that he just went through all the way and took his blood and sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat of God. I thank God for that. Because when Jesus gave up the ghost, the Bible lets you know that when Jesus gave up the ghost, that mercy fell over on grace. Thank God for that. Thank God for grace, man. Grace came by Jesus Christ. I thank God for that because had not been for Jesus, we'd still be killing turtle doves and, 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 and bulls and what have you, trying to sprinkle the blood on the altar, man. I thank God, man, that Jesus was the last sacrifice we ever needed. Man, thank God. 
You ought to be giving out of praise right now. You ought to just lift your hands right now and just thank Jesus that he didn't give up on you. Thank Jesus that he, he followed through and sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat of God. That grace showed up and grace kisses you every morning when you get up, when your feet hit the floor. Grace and, and, and mercy kiss you every morning. You ought to just thank God for that. Because Jesus could have given up. I thank God he didn't give up. Praise, thank you, Jesus. Now, so many saints quit right before the manifestation of their blessing. Hear me now. So many saints quit right before the manifestation of their blessing. And I'm thinking, if you just, just hang on there, you will see the manifestation of the blessing. See, oftentimes we think that, you know, we're praying and believing God to do something great in our life or to do something in our situations. And we think that just because we don't see anything happening, that God's not doing anything. Or we think just because we don't feel it, I don't feel it. I don't sense God doing anything. Just because you don't sense it, just because you don't feel it, just because you don't see anything moving, does not mean that God's not moving. When Daniel prayed for the Lord to supernaturally intervene, the angel of the Lord said, listen, from the time you prayed, Daniel, we heard you. And I was dispersed. I'm paraphrasing. He said, but I was dispersed. But it took me 20 and one days to fight the prince of Persia to get to you. The angel was saying, listen, it, it took me 21 days to fight in the spirit. It took me 21 days to fight in, in spiritual battle to get to you because the enemy was fighting me tooth and nail to keep me from getting to you. He said, but from the time you prayed, the Lord said to go. And I was fighting my way to get to you. 21 days to get to you, Daniel. But I heard you from the first time you prayed. And I'm telling you this morning, some of you are, uh, the enemy's telling you that you've been praying and believing God to do something in your situation. And heaven has turned a deaf ear on you. And I'm telling you this morning, that is a lie from the pit of hell. If you pray according to his will, he hears you the first time. And he's working on your behalf. And I'm trying to tell some of you this morning, don't you quit. God is working on your behalf. Just because you don't see him working does not mean he's not working. Just because you don't feel like he's working does not mean that he's not working. He's working on your behalf. Now, over in the book of Acts, I want to show you a story in the book of Acts that might demonstrate better what I'm trying to tell you this morning. In the book of Acts, beginning with verse 1, we got a situation here where Herod is trying to he has Peter locked up and he's going to kill Peter because he's been killing um, the disciples and killing uh, the saints. And it, 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 him killing the saints has pleased the Jews and the Jewish leaders. And so he now has Peter locked up and he's trying to wait until after Easter so he can go ahead and, and kill Peter. So but Peter's locked up. Now watch what the story says in, in Acts chapter 12, verse 1. It says, now about that time, Herod, the king stretched forth his hands to vax certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of the unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison. Verse 5, the text says, Peter therefore was kept in prison. Watch this now. It says, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And so Peter's locked up. But the text says that the saints are praying without ceasing for Peter. And the text says, and when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came up on him and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him. 
and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. Verse 10, and when they were past the first and the second ward, they came up on the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and had delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Now, let's start right there for a minute. Herod has Peter locked up in prison. He's going to kill him because it pleases the Jews that he's killing saints. And while he's in prison, the angel of the Lord shows up, tells Peter to get up. Peter gets up, his chains fall off. The angel of the Lord leads him out of the prison into the streets. And once Peter gets into the street, Peter realizes, hey, the angel has actually delivered me. The Lord has sent his angels to actually deliver me. For at that time, Peter was thinking he was seeing a vision. He didn't know that was actually happening until he got out into the street. So now the text says that he goes to Mary's house and he knocks on the door. And he goes there, knocks on the door, and they're there praying. They're at the house praying and, and Peter knocks on the door. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. Verse 14, and when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then they said, it is his angel. Verse 16, but Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he beckoned unto them with the hand to hold their peace declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now, I got a question for you this morning. And my question is this. For those of you who have been contemplating, giving up on the word, giving up on your faith, giving up on the church structure, just just giving up on this Christian stuff. For those of you who've been kicking it around in your head, who think, you know, this is getting to be routine, humdum, you know, this every Sunday I'm doing this, you know, this stuff. It's just, just kind of just getting, you know, kind of routine. You know, my question to you this morning is this. Are you praying and expecting God to answer your prayers or are you just praying out of habit? And let me ask you that question again. Are you praying with great expectation that God is going to answer your prayers or have you allowed yourself to just start praying out of habit? The text says in verse five, Peter therefore was kept in prison but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. In verse 12, the text says, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Now, the text says this. The text says in verse 5 that they're praying for Peter. Verse 12 says that Peter shows up, knocks on the door where they're praying. Verse 13 says, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. Verse 15, they said, you're out of your mind. They told her when she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angels. Now, here's my point. They're in a house praying for Peter because Peter has been imprisoned by Herod the king, and the Herod the king is going to kill this man. And so all the saints, the text says, are at Mary's house praying, and the text says the saints have been praying without ceasing. 
God answers their prayer. And he delivers Peter out of the hands of Herod. Peter then goes to the house where they're praying. He knocks on the door. Rhoda breaks out of the prayer circle, prayer meeting, goes to the door. She hears the voice of Peter, but she never opens the door. She runs back and says, Peter's at the door. And they say, are oh, you crazy? You lost your mind. You're mad. It's not Peter. It's his angel. God sent his angel. Let's get back to praying. So here they are praying for Peter to be delivered. God answers their prayer, but yet they do not believe that their prayer has been answered. And my question to you this morning is, have you allowed yourself to come into a place where you're just now, you're just praying, but you're not really expecting God to answer any of your prayers? You've gotten, have you allowed yourself to get into a, a rut where you're just praying because that's what Christians are supposed to do? I do 5.30 prayer because that's what we're supposed to do. I do 7 o'clock, 7.30 prayer in the evenings because, you know, that's, you know that's, that's what we do at Harvest Rain Church. I pray a little bit here and a little bit there because that's what Christians are supposed to do. We're supposed to pray. But some of us, you've been praying without ceasing for your situation. Some of you have been praying for years for God to heal your marriage. Some of you have been praying for years for God to turn your finances around. Some of you have been praying for years for God to heal your physical body. But you don't really expect anything to change. You don't really expect your marriage to change. You don't really expect God to bless you financially. You really don't expect God to heal you of this infirmity because you've had it for 15 years. This is your sickness. You've taken ownership of it now. This is my diabetes. This is my, my high blood pressure, my, my arthritis. It's yours now. You claim it. And so you pray about it, but you don't really expect God to do anything about it. So, you know, you're a Christian, you come to church. You come to church on a lot, you, you know, put a few dollars in the offering bucket. You know, you, you get on 530 prayer, you get on the evening prayer line, or you pray by yourself every now and then, a few minutes a day. But you're not really expecting God to do anything. You just like these folks who was at Mary's house praying for Peter without ceasing for him to be set free from Herod. And then Peter shows up at the door. God has delivered him. And they say, are oh, you crazy? It's his angel. So they're praying, but they don't have any expectation that God is going to do what they're praying for him to do. Some of you this morning, you're praying, but you no longer embrace the fact that God is in complete control. You're praying, but you don't longer embrace the fact that God can fix any situation in any circumstance. You're praying, but you really don't believe that there's nothing God can't fix. You don't really embrace that premise. You don't really stand in great expectation that there's nothing too hard for God. You're praying, but you don't really embrace the premise that there's nothing too hard for God. You have allowed yourself to be so frustrated, so disappointed, so defeated. Of course you pray, because that's what Christians do. We pray, right? That's what we do, man. And we pray in Jesus' name. That's what we do. But you don't really expect anything to happen. You haven't expected, some of you haven't expected anything to happen in years. Some of you have been, 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 been dealing with substance abuse and you've been praying for God to deliver you, but you don't really expect him to do it. Because after all, you've been dealing with it half your life. Your marriage has been jacked up for 15 of the 16 years you've been married. So, you, you know, you pray every now and then, pray for my marriage, pray for my spouse, pray for my husband. You, but you don't really expect God to really change the man. Why is that? It's because you have quit. You have given up on your faith. 
No, you still come to church. You're still physically there. No, you still read your Bible. You still read the word. You still shout hallelujah. You still worship. You still say praise the Lord. You still tithe. Partially. Some of us. But you have allowed yourself to get so hardened about your situation that you're no longer expecting God to move in your situation. When what you've been praying for is trying to get to you, you've got to know it in your spirit. When what you've been praying for is knocking at your door, you have to know it in your spirit. When what you've been praying for is right in front of you, you have to know it in your spirit. Some of you don't know it in your spirit because you have allowed your, your, your spirit to get hard. You have become a, let me put it this way, you have become hard of heart. And when you become hard of heart, you, it's very difficult for you to hear the voice of God. It's very difficult for you to hear that still small voice because you have become hardened of heart. But when you've been praying for God to do something, you got to know in your spirit that that thing is done. Verse 14, the text says, and when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. Watch this now. She knew Peter's voice. She didn't see Peter with her physical eyes. She heard Peter's voice. See, some of us, you know, God has answered our prayers, but because we don't see it, we can't hear the Holy Spirit ministering to us about it because of hardness of heart. Now watch this. She didn't open the door. She just heard his voice. Now, the text does not say she couldn't open the door. The text does not say that Rhoda was not authorized to open the door. The Bible makes it clear why she didn't open the door. The text says that she didn't open the door because of gladness. That's what the Bible says. In other words, she didn't open the door because she was overwhelmed by what was on the other side of the door. She didn't open the door because she was beside herself of her expectation. She, she's been expecting this moment. Rhoda has been praying without ceasing in the prayer circle with all the other saints and now she's at the door and on the other side of the door she hears the voice of her expectation and she is just elated. She is just like overwhelmed with joy. That's why she didn't open the door. The Bible says in verse 13, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, the dancer came to hearken named Rhoda. Rhoda left the prayer circle. She goes to the door. On the other side of the door, she hears Peter's voice and she is just blown away. She's like, man, God has come through for us. And she goes and tells the other, other intercessors, God's come through. Oh, you crazy. No, no, God's blessed us. God's really done this thing. Oh, you out of your mind. You're mad. No, 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 really, really. God has answered our prayers. And the Bible says because she was constantly going at them and telling them God's done this thing that they stopped praying and said wait a minute it's his angel it's not Peter it's his angel no she was filled with joy because she had a great expectation and expecting God to do this thing and the moment has come where God has answered her prayers man and she's blown away she, she couldn't open the door. 
She's just like, I mean, have you ever been in a situation where you have been believing God to do something in your situation and God comes through and just blows your mind and you're just like, I just, I, 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 you don't have words to explain it. In fact, you don't tell anybody for a while because in your mind you're thinking, they're not going to believe me. They, they're just not going to believe if I tell them what God just done. I've had some of those some of those blessings, man. I've had some of those situations, man, those mind blowing uh, blessings, those blessings that take your words away where God comes through and you're thinking, man, they're never going to believe this. They're never going to believe this in a thousand years, what God has just done. I've had one recently. I mean, you just, you know, when the time's right. But you're never going to believe it. God is awesome. <laughs> Jesus says in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, have faith in God. And he says in verse 24, therefore I say unto you what, those, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now, notice what Jesus says in Mark 11. Jesus says, don't just pray. He says, pray with faith in God. And he says, when you pray, believe that you receive those things that you pray for and you will have them. In other words, Jesus is saying, when you pray, don't just pray because it's time to pray. Don't just pray because you feel that it's your obligation to pray and that's what saints do. No, he says, when you pray, pray with an expectation that God is going to come through for you. God is going to meet your prayer. Amen, somebody. Amen. Some of us allowed ourselves just to just pray because, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's time to pray. But when we don't have no fire in us, we don't believe God's going to answer. We, it, it's just, you know, we just pray because that's what we're supposed to do. No, man, pray. And when you pray, pray in faith, believing that you have that which you desire and that you received it. And if you receive it, you will. You can, if you believe it and receive it, you can have it. Amen, somebody. Now, here's the thing. It's a fact that we tend to get what we expect out of life. It's a fact that we have a tendency to see what we want to see, to hear what we want to hear, to feel what we want to feel, how we expect to feel. It's a fact that we normally accomplish what we expect to accomplish. We achieve what we expect to achieve. My question to you this morning is, what are you expecting from God? What are you expecting from this, this faith journey with, with the Lord? Okay, you've been saved 15 years. You've been saved 10 years. You've been saved five years. Good. But are you still expecting God to come through? Do you still wake up every morning with joy? Do you still wake up every morning with great expectation? Do you still come to church expecting the Holy Spirit to speak? Not Pastor Doug to give a message. Because if you come to church looking for Pastor Doug to give a message, you're going to miss the voice of the Holy Spirit. But are you coming expecting the Holy Spirit to speak? You should never go to come to church or any service or listen to any word without saying, Holy Spirit, I'm looking for you to speak to me. I want you to use this vessel to speak a word to me this morning. Anytime you listen to the word, whether it's at church, whether it's on a CD, whether it's on YouTube, it don't matter. Anytime you set yourself down ready to hear the word of the Lord, you should place a demand on the Holy Spirit to speak a word directly to your spirit. And you should come expecting something from that word. Whether it comes from the introduction, whether it comes from the body, whether it comes from the conclusion, you should expect something from the word of God after listening to a message. Now, I don't care how many, how many times you don't heard a message on a certain subject, it don't matter. The word of God is pregnant, man. This word is pregnant with uh, revelation. You will never be able to exhaust the word of God. You should always place a demand on the Holy Spirit, speak to me. I'm sitting here for the next 45 minutes. I need to hear a word from, the, from heaven. 
And sometimes it'll be a scripture, sometimes it'll be one word, sometimes it'll be an illustration. But if you place a demand on the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. But you've got to come with great expectation, expect the Holy Spirit to speak. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verse 29, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. You should have great faith that God's going to do something in your situation. How can you call yourself a believer and you stop believing? I know some folks who call themselves believers who have stopped believing a long time ago. They don't even carry their Bibles anymore. They don't read their Bibles anymore. They just kind of pull up on the phone. And that's fine. I mean, have your apps and Bible apps. Do what you need, do what you need to do. I, I, you know, whatever works for you. But I don't know how you get away from the Word and reading the Word on a daily basis and get, get away from spending your time with the Lord and, 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 and quiet time, being still so God can minister to you. I don't know how you can not do that and say you're still expecting God to, to move you on your behalf. Here's my last point I want to make about this, and that is, you know, when what you've been praying for knocks at your door, that means it's time to move on to the next level. It means it's time to move on to that next phase. Let me say that again. When what you've been praying for, when what you've been believing God for, when it shows up, that means it's time for you to go on to that next level. It's time for you to move on. Why is that, Pastor? That it's because at this point, prayer has done all that it is designed to do. When what you've been praying for shows up, that means that now you've got to move on to that next phase because prayer has done what it was designed to do, and that is to manifest what you've been praying for. Yeah. Now, this is key because now prayer will never open the door. Let me say it again. Prayer will never open the door. Prayer will manifest that thing that you believe for, but it'll never open the door. You have to pray that thing to the door, and once that thing gets to the door, then you have to get up. In other words, you have to take some action. When you've been believing God for something, and that thing shows up, now you've got to take some action in terms of the manifestation of your prayer. Bible says faith without works is dead in verse 15 they said they said unto her thou art mad she said I'm not crazy she said I'm not crazy I'm not mad I know exactly what I know and I know that the very thing I've been praying for is on the other side of that door watch this and I haven't even seen Peter yet with my natural eyes I have not laid my natural eyes on Peter but I know that Peter's on the other side of that door. The very thing I've been praying for is on the other side of that door and I know by spirit of voice. And this is one of the things we have to understand and that is God's only gonna bring what you've been praying for to the door. Let me say it again. No matter what you're praying for, God's only gonna bring it to the door. And then once he brings that thing to the door, you're going to now have to do something. You're going to have to answer the door. In other words, you're going to have to have some action in relationship to what you believe in God for. See, if you don't have faith to do something, you will be confessing what you believe, but you'll never receive it. Some of us, we've just been confessing and confessing what we believe, confessing what we, we believe, but... We ain't done nothing outside of confessing. And because you have not put action, corresponding action to what you believe in your heart, you have not yet received what you believe in God for. The Bible says, James makes it very clear that faith without works is a absolute dead faith. Now hear me. If we don't learn 
to hear God knocking in the midst of noise, we'll give up. We will abort all that prayer time that we have devoted to a given situation if we don't learn how to hear God knocking in the midst of the chatter. Some of you have been praying and believing God for certain things. And God has been knocking in the midst of the chatter, waiting for you to receive what he has manifested. But you have not yet been able to discern that God has manifested the very thing that you've been believing for. And so you just keep praying. You just keep praying. You just keep praying when prayer has already done what it's designed to do. That is to bring the very thing that you believe in God for to the door. But now you got to get up and take some action and receive it. It's okay to pray without ceasing. And we're supposed to pray without ceasing. But it has to be an expectation attached to praying without ceasing. It has to be a manifestation. We have to know within our knower with great expectation that when I pray, God's gonna answer my prayer. And I'm not gonna quit on the word. I'm not gonna quit on God because I know that the God of whom I serve would never quit on me. And I know that I know within my spirit that this word is true, that this word works. And I know that if I continue to pray with great expectation that God would meet that expectation. What am I saying this morning? I'm simply trying to get across to some of us this morning that we have to come back to that place where we are serving the Lord Jesus Christ with a great expectation that whatever we believe in him to do, that he will do that very thing. And every day becomes a great excitement, a great journey, because we know that God is working on our behalf. And we know that he will, in his timing, in his own way, answer and bring to pass the very thing that we believe in him to do. How, do you, how can you say that, Pastor Dick? Because he's faithful. He's faithful to his word. He's faithful to his word. And God and his word are the same. Jesus and his word are the same. We read that in John. You cannot separate Jesus from the word. You cannot separate God from the word. God and the word are the same. And so if God is faithful, then his word is faithful. If God is true, then his word is true. Amen. And I pray this morning that you would come to that place where you say, you know what, maybe I need to take a, a quick evaluation of my, of, my, of my walk. Maybe I need to do a quick assessment of my expectation in the word of God. And maybe I have allowed myself to slip in expecting God to do certain things. Maybe I have allowed myself to get a little... Um, uh, hardened when it comes to my situation. Maybe I should step back and say, God, once again, give me the courage to believe like I should believe. Maybe I should come to that place where I acknowledge that maybe I have given up on my faith. Maybe I have given up on this word. Maybe I am just been going through the motions. Maybe I need to change some things and change how I think and change how I, I've been looking at things so God can once again meet my expectations. Amen? I, I pray that you do. Because this is what I know. I know that we serve a God who loves, absolutely loves blessing his people. And God is in the blessing business. And I know from his word and I know from experience that there's nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing too hard for the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I just praise you and thank you this morning for this opportunity to share your word. 
And Father, we just thank you for the Holy Spirit ministering to our hearts this morning. And Father, we thank you that uh, lives will be changed, Father, because of the infallibility of Scripture and because of the Holy Spirit ministering that word deep within the hearts of those who are listening. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you this morning. Thank you so much for listening. We look forward to ministering to you Wednesday night. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy your week. Amen. Well, praise God for that word. Amen. Well, we've come to a very important part of the service, and that is all to call. Where we extend the opportunity to those who are not saved, a chance to get saved. Amen. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And you know why? Because God loves you. God says, uh, uh, for God so loved the word that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. And here's a chance for you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior today. Amen. That is one of the most important relationships you can have here on earth. And it's very simple, but very deep. If you would, please repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you forgive me of all of my sins. I confess that I am a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins, went to hell, and rose on the third day. I now accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, praise God. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, you just got saved. And the angels are rejoicing in heaven. And we want to celebrate with you. There is uh, some information on the screen. We want to get you on our mailing list and make sure you're not on this walk alone. Amen. So we ask that you reply to this, this address and we will be in touch with you. Amen. Praise God. Well, amen. It is now offering time where you get the opportunity to worship your Lord in your giving. And I'm going to ask you to turn over to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, at around the 58th verse. And while you're doing that, I want to remind everyone that here at Harvest Ram, we have three ways in which you can give. You can text to give, or you can go to harvestrain.org and give online, or you can mail your offering in, and that information is on your screen. Amen. Well, praise God. I want to say that uh, in giving money to the church, um, giving is, is not so much about money as it is about faith and love. Uh, ironically, those were the, uh, the subjects we talked about uh, this past month, uh, faith and love. And then money plays a big part in that because they, the Bible says where your treasure is, that is where your heart is, amen. And then God also talks about having faith in him. Amen. So over in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, starting at 58 verse, it says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. Praise God. Whatever we do for the kingdom is not in vain. If you volunteer at the church as an usher or a greeter, it's not in vain. If you sing in the praise team, it's not in vain. When you give your money, it's not in vain. And I think if we looked at it in a smaller, simpler way, what God is asking us to do from a minimum standpoint is not that grandiose, amen? Think about it. Tithing. What is a tithe? It's 10%. If I had a dollar, a tithe of that would be a dime, 10 cents. It doesn't sound like a lot of money. It's not until we blow it up and we start looking at what we pull in that we start getting a little antsy about giving our tithe. But when we look at it from that point of view, it's just a bunch of dimes. Now, let me ask you this. Here at the church, we have a children's ministry and uh, uh, getting volunteers and having teachers and all that, it requires effort. Now, if I were to ask you to volunteer one day in the children's ministry, what would you say? 
I'm thinking you would say yes, one day, sure, I can do one day. And I said, that's only one caveat, is that you let me schedule that day. And I'm sure you would say, Brother Pete, go ahead, do what you want to do. I will ask you, that day, let me chop it up into 12 different visits. So it's 24 hours in a day, amen? I chop it up in, uh, into 12 different visits. There are 12 months in a year, and church service lasts about two hours. I'm asking you to give me 24 hours in one year. God is asking you for a dime out of every dollar you get. The minimum, that's the minimum. Not that big a deal, amen? So if you have prepared your hearts and mind to give, I ask you to stretch your hand toward the screen or you can lift your offering up and we're gonna pray for it, amen? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this day. We thank you for your word that went forth. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every person under the sound of my voice. I thank you for those who are sowing, dear God. I thank you, dear God, for those who are obedient to your word. Your word says you give seed to the sower. Your word also says that you bless those, dear God. That over in Malachi said you will pour out a blessing that they will not have room enough to receive. Dear God, we thank you for overflowing blessing. In Jesus' name, I pray that each and every person who is given, I pray they lack no good thing. I pray for those who desire to give but didn't have anything to give. I pray for seed. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I also pray for Harvest Rain Church, that what we receive in, dear God, will, will, will be the beginning for oh, doing all the work that you've called us to do, dear God. Reaching the lost, teaching the found, Heavenly Father, touching lives all around this globe, in Jesus' name. Touching lives, winning souls, saving souls, in Jesus' name, we pray and ask this, amen, amen, amen. Well, amen. Thank God for you. Thank you again for tuning in. We ask that you tune in next time. But until then, you be blessed.